Hello and welcome to my channel. This is Crime Me a River. I'm your host Shayna. Uh, please like, share, subscribe, you know, do whatever. Uh, I haven't uploaded a video in a minute and I'm very sorry about that. I just had um, some rough times and stuff and things and you know, but we're doing better. So today we are going to talk about Theodore Robert Bundy. Born November 24th, 1946 in Burlington, Vermont. Born as Theodore Robert Caldwell to Eleanor Louise Caldwell on the date I just mentioned. Uh, Eleanor Louise Caldwell, known as Louise, gave birth to Ted after uh, at Elizabeth Lynn Home for Unwed Mothers in Burlington, Vermont. The identity of Ted's father was never been confirmed. Some claim his father was a salesman and Air Force veteran named Lloyd Marshall. But then, according to Louise, she was seduced by a war veteran named Jack Worthington. When she became pregnant, he abandoned her. Some relatives of Ted believe that maybe Samuel Colwell, Louise's own dad, was Ted's father, but I don't believe that. Bundy lived with his maternal grandparents in Philadelphia for the first three years of his life. Ted's grandparents, Samuel and Eleanor Caldwell, raised him as their own. They told family and friends and Ted that they were his parents and that Louise, his mother, was his sister. Ted's stories of how he found out his sister was really his mother varied he told biographers that he had found his birth certificate but told a girlfriend that his cousin showed him his birth certificate after calling him a bastard writer Anne Rule wrote that she did not find out until 1969 Rule was a biographer and a true crime and later a true crime writer she personally knew Ted Ted had a lifelong resentment towards his mother after, for leaving him to learn about his real father on his own and never talking to him about it. At age three, Ted surrounded his Aunt Julia, Louise's younger sister, with kitchen knives, and when he, she woke up, Ted was standing by the bed smiling. Ted told Rule that he identified with respected and clung to his grandfather. Family members described Samuel as a tyrannical bully and a bigot who hated blacks, Jews, Catholics, and Italians. Oh, what hated me, I guess. He beat his wife and even, ha even the family dog. He threw Julia downstairs for oversleeping and swung neighborhood cats by their tails. Just a lovely man. Samuel couldn't would get violent when Ted's paternity was ever questioned and he spoke to unseen presences. Ted's grandmother periodically underwent electroshock therapy for depression and became a chlorophobia towards the end of her life, which means they don't like big open wide spaces like outside. Ted described her as obedient and timid. Louise and Ted moved to Tacoma, Washington with Alan and Jane Scott, their cousins. In 1950, she also changed her name, surname from Caldwell to Nelson. And in 1951, Louise met a hospital cook named Johnny Culpepper Bundy at Tacoma's first Methodist Church's adult singles night. But that was awesome. Ooh, yeah. Uh, in 1952, they married and Johnny adopted Ted. Because that's awesome. They went on to have four kids. Ted was was distant with his stepdad, even though Johnny included him in family activities, camping and stuff. Uh, Ted later said that Johnny wasn't bright and he didn't make much money. Ted once described wandering in a neighborhood, picking through trash cans, looking for photos of naked women, or and said he would get drunk and canvas the community late at night looking for undraped windows hoping to see women changing or whatever he could see 
Growing up, Ted was well known and well liked in school. Classmates described Ted as a medium sized fish in a large pond. But Ted said, I don't know what underlay social interactions and that he didn't know what made people want to be friends. Ted was good at downhill skiing. I mean, sure. Which he loved and even stole equipment for. Gotta have hobbies. <laughs> he was arrested at least twice during high school for suspicion of burglary and auto theft. Details of the incidents were expunged he, when he turned 18. Ted finished high school in 1956. Ted transferred to the University of Washington to study Chinese after attending university at Pudnant Sound for a year. Ted started dating a classmate. Oh, Ted started dating either her name is Stephanie Brooks or Diane Edwards. I've seen Diane Edwards as well. I'm going to call her Diane because I think that's her name, but whatever. Who cares? None of this is her fault. Please do not bother anybody. I mean, shit, most of these people are probably close to being retirement age. You probably wouldn't even remember half the crap anyway, but maybe not. Maybe they will always remember Ted, but let's leave him alone. Start dating Diane, a classmate of the University of Washington in 1967. That's the year Kirk Cobain was born. Uh, Ted dropped out of college and worked some minimum wage jobs. He volunteered for Nelson Rockefeller's presidential campaign. Ted became a Rockefeller delegate and attended the 1969 Republican National Convention in Miami because he was a clean-cut Republican, believe it or not. Brooks or Edwards, whatever, Diane, ended their relationship and returned to California. She described Ted as immature and lacked ambition. Ted was devastated by the breakup. Diane was beautiful, wealthy, smart, and came from a powerful family. Just everything that he wanted and was looking for. A psychiatrist named Dorothy Lewis said this crisis was probably the pivotal time in his development. After his breakup, Ted described visiting relatives in Arkansas and Philadelphia and even enrolled in Temple University for one semester for one semester. Rule believes early 1969 around this time Ted visited Burlington's office of birth records and confirmed his true parentage. In the fall of 1969 Ted went back to Washington where he met Elizabeth Liz. We're just gonna call her that. I know her real name, you can look it up, find it. I just don't want to give it out. Again, don't bother any of these people, please. A single mom from Orden? Odin? Odin. Ugin. I don't even know. Utah. She's from Utah, guys. Liz was <clears throat> a secretary at the University of Washington School of Medicine. Their, rock, their rocky relationship lasted past the initial incarceration in Utah in 1976. Liz had a three-year-old daughter named Molly when she met Ted. Ted was a father figure for Molly and remained in her life until she was 10. Ted was sexually inappropriate towards her, including sexual touching and disguised as games and indecent exposure. Ted enrolled at University of Washington as a psychology major in the mid-1970. He was well regarded by his professor and was an honor student. Ted worked at Seattle Suicide Hotline Crisis Center. He met former Seattle police officer and later crime writer Ann Roll, who we talked about previously, who later wrote a Ted Bundy biography, The Stranger Beside Me. Roll described him as kind and empathic. Ted graduated in 1972 from University of Washington, joining Governor Daniel Evans' re-election campaign pretending to be a college student. Later, Evans appointed Ted to the Seattle's Crime Prevention Committee. So, as you can see, he's getting quite a repertoire of how to deal with people. Psychology, crime prevention, you know. 
Ted was hired as an assistant for Ross Davis, chairman of the Washington State Republican Party, after Evans was reelected. Davis described him as smart, aggressive, and a believer in the system. Yeah. In 1973, Ted was accepted into law school of UPS and the, and the University of Utah. Ted rekindled his flame with Diane in 1973 during a trip to California on a Republican Party business. Diane was in awe of the man Ted had became a serious and de dedicated professional who was about to have a significant legal and political career. Mind you, he was still dating Liz at the time. Ted enrolled at UPS school in 1973, still dating Edwards. He visit she'd visit him in Seattle several times and stay with him. Ted and Diane discussed marriage and in January of 1974, Ted stopped all contact with Diane. Basically, got her all high and heavy and then just fucking cut her off. I would be pissed too. A month later, she finally got a hold of him and she asked, you know, why he ended their relationship. He replied in a flat, calm voice, Diane, I have no idea what you mean, and then hung up the phone. Ted later stated, I just wanted to prove to myself that I could have married her. Ted deliberately planned the relationship and breakup in advance. Sweet revenge. By this time, Ted started missing classes at law school and in April, no longer attended. No one really knows when Ted started killing. He told different stories to different people and didn't give details of any of his early crimes. Ted confessed to 30 murders the night before his execution. I think he did this in a way to think, oh, they're going to keep me alive because I can tell him more details about these things and these people. But, you know, some of them were identified. How can you keep track? I don't know, but I don't think he really knew. I definitely think there was more, but we'll get into that. Ted victims were mostly white females ages 17 to 23. Well, children, he killed children too, by the way. They were physically attractive in college, not all of them, financially independent or showed personality traits of independence. Some believe Ted preyed upon as high as 100 or more. I am in that sum because Ted would say shit like, when FBI agents asked if the total was 36, Ted said, add one digit to that and you'll have it. And he also said for every murder publicized, there could be one that was not. So that would be like 60 or 70 murders. He described himself as the most cold-hearted son of a bitch you'll ever meet. Even his attorney, Polly Nelson, wrote, Ted was a very definition of a heartless evil. He said that his first attempted kidnapping was in Ocean City, New Jersey in 1969. Remember when he went back to visit his family? That's probably around that time. He also told Nelson that he did not kill anyone until 1971 and told a psychologist that he killed two women in Atlantic City while visiting in Philly in 1969, which again, I believe, Detective Robert Keppel said Ted told him he committed murder in Seattle in 1972 and murdered a hitchhiker in Turnwater, Washington in 1973, which is why myself and others believe he started when he was still a teen. Ted was 27 when his first documented murders were committed in 1974. Ted admitted by that time he had mastered the necessary skills to leave minimal forensic evidence in the error before DNA profiling. Around the time he stopped his relationship with his chosen one, Edwards or Brooks, whatever her name is, Ted broke into a basement apartment of 18-year-old Karen Sparks, a student of University of Washington and a dancer. Trigger warning, it's going to get rough here on out. Around midnight on January 4th, 1974, Ted beat Karen Sparks unconscious with a metal rod from her bed frame and also stuck it in her. Not one of her re several roommates heard anything. 
They found her a few hours later with her face and hair matted with blood. Karen was unconscious for 10 days and had permanent mental and physical disabilities. A month later, Ted broke into another basement. This time it was Linda Ann Healy's room in the early morning of February 1st. Linda was a University of Washington undergrad who reported the morning radio weather reports for skiers. Again, he beat a woman unconscious. He changed her clothes and he put her in blue jeans and a white blouse and boots and carried her out into the night. Female college students started disappearing at a rate of one per month in the beginning of 1974. Donna Gell, Donna Manson, a 19-year-old student at Evergreen State University in Olympia. She left her dorm to attend a jazz concert on campus but never arrived. That was March 12, 1974, 60 miles southwest of Seattle. Susan Elaine Rancourt disappeared on April 17th while on her way to her dorm room after advisor meeting at uh, that evening. This was at Central Washington State College in Ellensburg, about 110 miles southwest of Seattle. Three nights before Rancourt's disappearance, three or two female students reported honoring a man wearing a sling who was asking for help carrying a load of books to his brown or tan Volkswagen Beetle. On May 6th at Oregon State University in Corvallis, Roberta Kathleen Parks left her dorm to have coffee with friends but never showed up. This was 260 miles south of Seattle. Thank you for watching. Again, uh, this was the first part to a two or three part series. Not sure. I'm still working on it. And thank you for watching and I appreciate every one of you. I love you. Have a great and beautiful day. Bye.